It's a little difficult for me to compose myself after hearing our beloved Sheikh Abdul Karim, and um, he's also my my big brother, my in, my big brother who I love for the sake of Allah. Um, that when I had first gone to, and traveled to to Yemen, Hadramut, he was uh, one of the first people from our cohort of. Um, you know, students in the West who had gone to seek knowledge, and um, all of us kind of considered him a big brother, um, you know, sort of a, a mentor and a teacher. And for those of you that are here in, in Michigan, I, you know, really encourage you to, to seek out his circles and his lessons and to gain benefit from him like many of us did. May Allah preserve him and preserve all of us and keep us on the straight path. Um, the idea of we being a religious minority in this greater society, in this larger society, um, has an interesting parallel, of course, because when the Muslims started out in Mecca, they were the religious minority, in, surrounded by a society that didn't really share any of their beliefs. And yet, the way that the Prophet ﷺ, referred to them as, as uh, Shaykh Abdul Karim mentioned in his dua, Allah Mahdi Qawmi, Oh Allah, please guide my people. In that he did not consider him or his, the believers to be distinct from the people that they came from, from the greater society, that these were still my people, as he would say. Allah Mahdi Qawmi. And all of the prophets actually had the same prophetic attitude, which was whoever they were sent to, bring the message, they considered them our people. And that, first and foremost, should be a lesson for how we even speak about the society that we live in. That you are a part of a larger people, and your concern should be not only for those who share your particular faith, or your particular way of interpreting your faith, but to everyone who's in the society around you. These are your people. And what affects them affects you. You should be saying to, oh, my people, what affects you affects me. Whatever harms you harms me. Your greater good is in my interest as well. And that is one of the consistent ways you see in all of the prophetic traditions of all the prophets. That was their attitude towards the people they were sent to. Um, and despite being a minority who we believe, inshallah, has a, a tradition of truth that we are hopefully maintaining and able to spread, um, it can happen sometimes a psychological thing where you lash out as you're the minority, so you lash out at those that don't share your belief and Maybe you're insecure about being the minority. Maybe you, you feel like you're always being attacked. And so you feel like, well, these are just disbelievers. These are just the kuffar. And you try to put a separation between you and everyone else around you and almost put yourself on a higher level, saying, well, at least we believe these people don't believe. Of course, belief entering your heart was not your own choice. That was a decision by Allah that you should believe and one of the du'as that we ask is that, Allah, you gave us this faith, so please don't take it away from us. Because he could in any moment. But it's interesting, you'll sometimes get arrogant or prideful of things that you didn't actually do yourself. Your own intellect, you may get really arrogant about your own intellect, but you didn't design your brain. Allah designed your brain. You may get arrogant about the wealth that you have, but you didn't, you know... Even though you work and you, you might have earned the money in a, in a materialistic sense, it was Allah who decreed for you what your wealth will be. That was not in your control. And you becoming a Muslim even, or being Muslim, or being born into a Muslim family, 
That's not something you uh, intellectually chose. That was written for you to happen. And so to be arrogant about it is a strange thing. It's a, a gift that was given to you. You yourself did not accomplish that. So to hold on to that gift is a great and humbling experience. Um, and you'll find that we tend to create this sense of the other with the society around us. Um, and that wasn't the practice of the Prophet ﷺ. There's an interesting story of a Sahabi, who became a man who became Muslim, so he became a Sahabi. And uh, he was from a, a tribe called Dos. And he went back to his people and tried to call them to Islam. And he spent a long time calling these people to the faith and trying to show them a better way to live and trying to improve their way of life. And they just rejected him. Not a single one of them listened to him. They, you know, th you know cast him out. They, had not, they didn't want anything to do with him. And this man got so frustrated after all this time he spent, you know, trying to show them the way. He came back to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he was very frustrated. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, they don't listen. They don't, wanna, they don't want to believe. So can you just make dua to Allah that Allah, you know, punish them and just completely remove them from the face of the earth? Just make, Allah, make dua to Allah that Allah destroys them. And the Prophet ﷺ, he raised his hands. And as soon as he did that, some of the Sahaba said, Halaka dos. The, as soon as they saw him raise the hand, the dua, the, the, you know, the supplication of the Prophet is, is accepted. It's mustajab. So they assumed if he's going to make dua against these people, that's it. The tribe is gone. They all said, dos is gone. That tribe of dos is gone. And yet he said, when he raised his hand, he said, Allah Mahdi Dos Wa'ti Bihim Jami'an. Allah Mahdi Dos Wa'ti Bihim. Oh Allah, guide Dos and bring them to me. That was his dua. And sure enough, in some amount of time, every single one from that tribe came and they all became Muslim. And this was the mission that he was sent with it, as Sheikh Abdul Karim mentioned he was not sent to curse people that they should burn in hellfire or that they should be destroyed. He wanted the exact opposite for his people. As Allah says in the Quran, Ya, ya Muhammad, it's almost as if you had this, this suicidal pain inside of you when people would not believe when your own people would not believe and, and follow this way that you were trying to teach, it's almost as if you had this pain in you, Ya Muhammad, this, like a self-inflicting pain almost, that it hurt you so much because they were not believing. That's how attached he was, his heart was to the people around him, even though they weren't believing, even though he, they were a religious minority being persecuted, they had a lot of sanctions against them, a lot of uh, prejudice against them, discrimination they were facing. I mean... You know, we talk about the things that we face in post 9-11 America as Muslims, but, you know, we, could, we can at least eat, you know? We can at least go to any restaurant we choose and get food. This wasn't the case for the, for the early Muslims. They had such severe sanctions on them. And yet, the attitude of the Muslims and, and, the, and, and, by, and by way of the teachings of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was a, a sense of mercy for these people around us. And... You know, we've come to the point, I feel, where we have this sense of otherness um, with the greater society. The, I lived in here in, in Detroit for um, six years when I was going to grad school, and I really appreciate, appreciated the time because I, I got a, a sense of history that I probably would never have had had I stayed in California. Um, Detroit is a very unique place, as and Sheikh Abdul Karim probably has observed as well. Um, and in particular, the history of the intertwining of Islam in America and the African-American presence is so rich in this community. And to be aware of that actually, for me personally, gave me a sense of connectedness to the greater society uh, around me. Not a sense of otherness, like I'm somehow different from you, but actually more integrated feelings of like, I want good for 
you and me, that we will all have a similar interest in mind, a similar goal that we're going for. Again, Allah Mahdi Qawmi, oh Allah, guide my people. These are all my people. Um, since the topic is lessons of the prophets, and you know, I was thinking about other prophets ex examples as well, in addition to our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu which Sheikh Abdul Karim beautifully summarized some of his, the, the, the emotional ways in which he would um, show his concern. Um, you know, in, in, uh, in southern Yemen, there is the maqam of uh, Nabi Allah Hud, the, the, the Prophet Hud, alayhi salam. And um, so his story gets, gets recited a lot and talked about a lot in that part of the world, just simply because of the proximity of, of his grave, alayhi salam. And in Surah Hud, uh, I'm sorry, in Surah Al-A'raf, um, Al there's the story of Hud, specifically mentioned where the people of, that Hud was sent to, his people, as he was trying to talk to them about what it is to be a believer, they said, "Inna la naraka fi safahatin, wa inna la nadhunka min al kathibin." That, you know, who we think you're an idiot, and on top of that, we think you're a liar. That's what they said to him. You know, like we we just don't we don't like you. We don't like what you're telling us. We don't like the behavior that you're trying to to change in us. We don't like what you're trying to teach us. We don't like you. We think you're you're being stupid, frankly. And on top of that, we think you're just telling a bunch of lies. Now think about emotionally how you would react to that. What would be the reaction to that? Like normally when, you know, in the, you think of a childhood schoolyard, a playground, and someone says, hey, you're stupid. And the other person says, no, you're stupid. And they just name call back and forth. And in, really, and in reality, I mean, if you, objectively, these people were not being very smart in saying this because they're incurring the wrath of Allah. So if you want to make a case of for who is showing more idiocy in this situation, it would have been those people accusing. There would have been an, even an objective reason to say, hey, no, 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 you are being the idiots here. But Hud's response is, قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ Oh, my people. لَيْسَ بِي سَفَاهَةٌ وَلَكِنِّي رَسُولٌ مِّن رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ أُبَلِّغُكُمْ رِسَالَاتِ رَبِّي وَأَنَا لَكُمْ نَاصِحٌ أَمِينٌ Oh, my people, I'm not an idiot. That's all he said. He didn't, didn't try to throw it back at them. I'm not an idiot. I'm just a messenger that was sent by God. And I am here for you to give sincere advice. Really, like sincerely, I want good for you. That was his response, the prophetic teaching. Um, and then he even addresses their their, their concerns. Don't you probably find it strange that a reminder from God would come to a man from amongst yourselves to warn you? That he would even, you know, he's even validating their xenophobia, right? They're like, we don't like you. You're kind of weird. We don't understand why you would be here and what you're doing. And, and, and he's saying, you know, this is probably strange to you. That you would think like, that why would this message, you know, why would this message come from God to one of, one of just a regular guy like amongst you, a regular created being just like you? Um, and at the very end when he kind of um, talks about, the, the wrath that could be incurred from Allah, if they continue down this path, he says, um, So just, if you're really going to go down this path, just wait and see what the consequences with. And by the way, I am here waiting with you. And I don't, from my understanding, and Sheikh Abdul Karim, you can correct me on this, but from my understanding, I don't think that was a spiteful statement. Like, all right, we'll just wait and see. He cares for these people. So he's saying, well, wait, and I, I'm waiting here with you. I'm waiting here with you to see what will be the amr, what will be the command of Allah that will befall. In other words, we're in this together. You know, I'm trying to help you in a sincere way. And I think this attitude is something that um, we as, you know, our communities have uh, come so far away from, particularly when we worry about what the greater society thinks about us. You know, it's true. We do face a lot of discrimination. 
It's true, we do face a lot of xenophobia. People don't like us. They think we're foreign. They think we're strange. And yet, in the face of all that, what, do, what does the Qur'an teach us? What does Allah want us to, how does he want us to respond? From the prophetic traditions, it's clear that we are still, like, despite all that, we're still ha we still have the best interests of the people around us in mind. Whatever it be, may be, calling them to the, to the faith and helping them in their society, um, helping the greater good of everyone around us, being socially engaged, being involved in social justice issues. I mean, there's so many major issues happening right now in this country, and Muslims have a great opportunity to come to the forefront and, and really show the care that we have for these major issues that are happening. Um, you know, and, and it's an it's a interesting time because we could unfortunately step back into a, a, an isolated look, a, an isolated way, and not engage in these greater issues. But it is, it is really our, our duty to be at the forefront of the issues that ba greatly benefit the society around us, whether that in each and every one of us have, has strengths that we could you know, utilize for that. You, if you're someone who's more concerned about environmental issues, well, believe me, there's some serious environmental issues that our society needs to uh, address. If you're concerned about social justice issues, there's some serious social justice issues happening right now that we need to address. Financial issues as well. Um, you know, policy, all kinds of things. Family life, social work, social work issues, mental health issues, all of these things where Muslims could be at the forefront out of concern for your people. Now, some of you um, might say, well, I'm not sure how much I relate to these people, the people around me. And I'll ask just a very simple question. I think, um, how many of you have traveled overseas? Good number of you, okay? And um, how many of you, when you're overseas, have been told that I recognize you as an American, like you're American. Even, like, even if you come from Pakistani or Arab descent, when you go back to the home country, don't your relatives tell you, yeah, I mean, you're not really from here. You're, the way you talk, the way you dress, something about you. My wife has this interesting story. When she went back to Egypt for the first time in a long time, she saw all her cousins in Egypt. They lost her suitcase. So she arrives in Egypt with none of her, her, her belongings. So she has to go to the local markets and just buy local Egyptian clothing that all the other Egyptian girls wear. And she was, so then she thought like, okay, cool. She go, wanted to go to like the museum or to go to the things. And she would always get charged the, char the price of a foreigner. And she said, I don't understand. I, I'm, I'm with my cousins. I'm dressed exactly like them. And yet everybody immediately recognizes me as an American. So, you know, you are a product of, you know, you, you know, you absorb the society around you from the moment, you know, wherever you were born and raised, you grew up, the things that you ate, the cartoons that you saw as a child, the, the, the cultural back, backdrop of, of, of the different, you know, um, um, creative things you're exposed to, intellectual things you're exposed to, all of that goes into who you are. And I think it's about time. I mean, now, I mean, we're like, we're not just children of immigrants. And we have children of children of immigrants now. We have people intermarrying with, with various races and different cultures. We're at the point now where we're beyond, like, whether or not this is our society and these are our people. And now it's about time to, you know, ask, are we going to be held accountable before Allah for the concern that we should have had for our people? So I ask Allah, inshallah, to rectify our hearts, to purify our intentions, and to uh, make us amongst those that can hold on to his rope in the face of adversity and in the face of discrimination.